G'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I have a chat with good mate and fellow bird photographer, Jan Wagner. We talk about all things bird photography related with a focus on editing images. Jan was actually one of the very first people I admired online. I remember when I started out, I saw his images and just thought, how did he get those images? So it was so much better than anything I could take. So his images were kind of a catalyst for me to learn and grow and try and figure out how to achieve similar images. I've been very fortunate that over the years I've met Jan. Last year we went on a trip with another mate into the Mallee area of Victoria and we got some really good shots including Major Mitchells and other things. Jan's actually got a video on his YouTube channel of our adventures so you feel free to check that out. If you're not aware of who Jan is, he goes by the nickname of the Bird Whisperer and that's because of his ability to photograph rare and hard to photograph birds. He's photographed a lot of parrots and different birds that are notoriously difficult to photograph. Jan's also got a very successful YouTube channel of his own and has a large following on social media. I'll put all the links below if you want to know further information about it. So one thing that makes Jan stand out is his attention to detail. His images always look really good and it's obvious to me that he really knows what he's doing when it comes to editing. Lucky for us, Jan has actually released a masterclass on editing and it's available for purchase off his website. He goes into a lot of detail about how he processes images and I have been fortunate to watch it and learnt a lot while doing so. I highly suggest making a cuppa, sit back and enjoy our chat. All right, g'day Jan, thanks for joining me today. Maybe we could just start with you telling me about how you got into bird photography and, and your journey so far. I was always interested in birds. Over time I kind of developed an interest in photography as well. I managed to buy my first kit which was Canon 20D and a first version 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Right. And so that was kind of my first venture into sort of real nature photography over time. I got a 500 millimeter lens and that's when it sort of started to become really serious, graded to a 600 mil lens and that's where I'm at now. But yeah, a couple of photos you've shared with me uh, that you took with your 20D. The first one is a common merganza, I think, and that was near my house in Berlin in Germany and I was like so stoked, finally I got like so close to a bird and I, th I was pretty proud with, of the picture back then. Now I look at it and I'm like, Ooh, it's, a good, it's a bit rough. Good behaviour though, it's catching a fish of some sort. Yeah, but obviously you'd want a much lower angle now and a lot of other things. But that's, I think, how we all start. I think people forget that they see my pictures now on the internet and somehow assume that's the kind of pictures that I always took. But that's really not the case. I think for everyone who does photography, it would be the same for yes, you. Yes, for sure. You start out in a certain way and you start out with not knowing anything, really. Mm -hmm. We all start with no knowledge, essentially, and we just have to then teach ourselves how to get better and for me it was just always looking at other people's images that I aspire to take and then trying to figure out what they were doing and eventually getting there. Yeah no well you've definitely got there that's for sure. You've shared a few of your photos with me what are you trying to achieve in the shots now so what are you actually trying to capture or what are you trying to get in the photos? Well it's an interesting question because I guess a lot of my style and how I take images has kind of developed over time and what I want to do now is I think is just bring the nice colors and vibrancy of nature to people and just show people how I see nature, how I experience nature and that's very vibrant and bright and lively and that's why I edit my images the way I edit them and I take them the way I take them so I'd love to have the bird really be the hero of the shot where people can really appreciate all the details, all the colors and then I like to frame it with a nice perch to just add bit of that sort of natural element to it and then so you know from all my images the background is kind of just the color but that's what appeals to me because I can kind of eliminate the background to the point that it just complements the image yep. but doesn't distract from it and I think that's kind of what I try to achieve now with that sort of style of photography that I do. Yeah we can see it in this uh, western spinebill shot that you've shared uh, the bird looks fantastic awesome calling pose and it's a, obviously a native a Western Australian plant with those beautiful pink flowers. So that obviously puts all those components you're talking about together in that shot. Yeah, and I think that's just something that I try to achieve, that you have the bird, but also not just on a stick. Mm -hmm. I know that's kind of the classic thing, the bird on a stick. That can work sometimes as well, especially if it's a stunning bird. Mm -hmm. But a tiny little bird like that spine bullet, obviously looks the best if there's some nice pretty flowers with it or something that on like a big log wouldn't quite look the same. Got this uh, 
black cockatoo and WA on a grass tree, which is obviously a fantastic mm -hmm. image and one that you just had to be in the right place, I'm assuming, when that to take that one. Yeah, that's one, for instance, that you can't plan at all. Even if you go there now, the chance that you actually see one of these cockatoos perched on a grass tree like this is probably almost none. Yeah. It's definitely one of my favorite shots. None, and for sure, it's fantastic. That's just a lucky one, basically. <laughs> I think we all get a few of those and wish we could replicate it, but it is tough, as you say, that's for sure. So you sort of mentioned that you've gone for the, you know, the, the colorful sort of birds. Is that what's attracted you to the parrots in Australia? You've obviously, um, a lot of your shots are parrots. Is that what attracts you to them? I guess generally a lot of the parrots have really spectacular colors as well. So it's always really nice to see those and to capture those. Talking of spectacular colors, you've shared with us this Major Mitchell cockatoo, uh, which is absolutely amazing. I know we went birding last year together and actually found these birds. We didn't get this shot, but we saw them up close and they're absolutely amazing. But you must have been stoked to get this photo. Yeah, that was another bird that I wanted for many, many years. and. They're not uncommon, but they're very hard to kind of track down. I think they're just here, there and everywhere. And then you just get lucky sometimes that they come to like a watering mm -hmm. hole. And I was just talking about sticks before. So in this <laughs> case, if you have like a stick that has a lot of nice character to it with a spectacular bird on it, it can actually work. It's always good to keep in mind as well where the bird lives. Like a spinebill, it's always near flowering bushes, basically. Mm -hmm. But the Major Mitchell's cockatoo might never see a flowering bush in his life basically. Yeah. So I think it's always good to kind of match the perch and the bird to have it like really realistic. Yeah, 100%. And obviously to get the crest up on that species is, is good too and, and can be hard to achieve. Well, that's the key I think. And when you look at pictures of them, you often see that with the crest down, they almost look like a different mm -hmm. bird. They just become like a kind of fluffy white bird, you almost see no colors, but when the crest is up, the whole body posture kind of changes and all the pink comes out and obviously the spectacular colors in the crest come out. So yeah, it makes a big difference with that bird. And usually they only have to crest up right after they land. Mm -hmm. So it might be like, what, two, three seconds that they have to crest up and the rest of the time, it's just yeah, a bit ugly. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I asked you to uh, share a couple of your favorite images that you've taken over the years. You've obviously got a lot and it's hard to narrow them down, but uh, <laughs> one of the first ones that you sent me were these Gouldian finches, obviously a highlight of a recent trip you took up north. And if you could just tell us a little bit about that image. Well, that was sort of a targeted trip to trying to get those birds. For a while it didn't really work and then we found a spot where there's a bunch of them coming into like a water source every morning so we just set up a couple perches next to the water and when the birds before they don't really like landing on the ground so if you put a few sticks there they like to have like a tree at the top and then kind of come down to your perch and then go to the water it actually makes them feel safer so you kind of help them out by having a few perches mm -hmm. there getting five males kind of perfectly spaced out is obviously next level you're just planning and preparing things properly and I think that's a lot of things that you can't really see with my shots, but that goes into these sort of images. There's a lot of thinking and preparation mm -hmm. to get a shot like this. And you will never get a shot like this just walking through the bush and hoping that they would just sit nicely lined up for you in a tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, that background, is that just like a creek bed or, a, or rocks? Or yeah, that's yeah. just the other side of the creek bed. If you want to get a lot of birds in focus and you're using setups, or in general, even if you just see a lot of birds sitting somewhere, you would have to try and line yourself up in a way that the perch is parallel to your sensor. Because mm -hmm. if it's kind of like this, it will always be parts out of focus and parts in focus. Whereas if it's like this, even with a really wide aperture, you can still get all the birds sharp because it's directly in line with your center. So the depth of field covers the whole length of the perch. So I'm assuming, or well, I know, you're obviously shooting high speed, so you're taking a lot of shots at once to hopefully get one of them that's sharp and has the pose that you want is obviously the key. Yeah, and that's especially if there's multiple birds, the, there's not many times when all the birds look in the right direction, so it's really key to just fire away and hope that one time you get where all the heads are kind of aligned in a good mm -hmm. way. That's certainly the challenge with multiple birds, because often you get two birds looking great and a third mm -hmm. one's looking away or... 
a fair bit of planning goes into some of these shots and uh, I thought it'd be fun to ask you what species took you the longest and how many attempts you made to photograph this bird. I think sometimes what happens is people see your images online and they think, oh, you, you know, you go out, you take this shot and you come home. But obviously there's a lot of work behind the scenes and you often go home without anything. So what was that species that took you forever to, to get? Well, it, it would be very nice if I could just go out and get those nice shots. That would, that would make it a lot easier. And you know from our road trip we did last year in June what kind of grind it can mm -hmm. be. Like we got some nice shots in the end, but we spent over a week driving thousands of kilometers, not really getting much for a few days in a row. And it was minus three degrees, <laughs> very cold, sitting in a tiny little metal hive. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's a lot of planning and preparation that goes into it. And for me, it was definitely those region parrots. That were parrots I was very interested because in, that was one of the birds that I had back in Germany as a teenager that I was breeding. So I have like a sort of special connection with them. I must say now I definitely prefer to kind of see them fly through the outback. Mm -hmm. And the closest for me is probably what, five, six hours away from them or something. So over the years afterwards, I've probably done at least one trip a year to that area trying to get some shots, but never got anything, never even got close. Yeah, I think it was May 2018 when I thought, oh, I'll just have to do another trip, <laughs> different time of the year, let's try that. I think first time I tried was like October, then I tried July, then I tried August, then I tried September, and I mean, then I talked to some other people that seemed to have success in April, May, so I thought, oh yeah, I'd try that. And I got there, the birds were there, I set up and I had up to like 12 of them on my purchase. So that was just totally crazy. Next day I break something on my car and I'm stuck for a week in this country town <laughs> because I had to wait for the parts to come. But I got yeah. the shots and now it's a good story. But I'm still stoked that I was finally able to get those shots because they're just a spectacular bird and fun bird. Yeah, no, they're beautiful and you've done a lot better than me. I've tried a couple of times and had no success. So um, hopefully another time I'll get another chance. But um, I thought I'd just uh, talk about a couple of images of yours that I really, really like. The first one is this gibber bird. For people that aren't aware, this is a, a ground dwelling bird sort of. You've got to go, I've never even seen it. You've got to go into the outback of Australia to see it and it lives on the ground on these rocks. So it could be hard to find them in the first place because they kind of blend in. But this shot just sort of has everything that I'm looking for in an image. You've got the bird's pose is fantastic, the eye contact's great, the exposure's great, and the inclusion of habitat is what really does it for me, that, that little flower and those little shrubs. That image is just outstanding. You must have been stoked with that. Yeah, I was really happy with that shot. and. As you said, they live in areas where if you just saw a photo, you would not think anything could live there. It's literally just rocks on the ground for the next thousand kilometers. You can't even see anything else. Yeah. So it's just rocks on the ground and suddenly you see like this little yellow bird running through the rocks. Yeah, this was outside Kubapedia and I was just driving around looking for these birds and suddenly I spotted like this little thing just running through the rocks. And it was just kind of looking for insects and stuff and so there was just a few little rocks and little kind of hills next to the road that probably just from the road grading off you just ah. push a bit of dirt to the side and so it built like a nice little kind of wall and I noticed that it always likes to stand on like a rock that's a little bit bigger than the other rocks so I just put a nice rock in between ah. some of the nice flowers that I could find and then when it just kind of came through it just goes like from rock to rock and then it just stands on a rock and looks up for a little bit and then it runs to the next rock. So it's just a bit of planning, a bit of luck. So yeah, and that's what brings it all together. Yeah, a bit of field craft there, obviously. To, and that's often the key is to watch the behavior because birds will often repeat their behavior. And if you can predict where they're gonna go or give them an opportunity, they'll often do it and obviously results in that shot, which is amazing. We've talked a little bit about all these awesome shots. Uh, what makes them awesome, uh, apart from taking them in the field, is obviously editing these photos and all of your images are obviously edited to a really high standard. So I thought we'd just have a quick chat about the editing process and what that involves. And I guess the first question is, why edit photos at all? Because if you're shooting in RAW, I think it's just a necessity to actually edit your images because the aim of the raw format is not to give you a finished file it's to give you 
a mm. nice flat file with the most information and details possible in the file so you can then convert it and then edit it into the file that you actually want. So I think editing is a very big and important part and I'm certainly an advocate of it because I want my pictures to look as good as possible. Yeah, no, for sure. Definitely, I agree with what you're saying. It's that the process is, doesn't stop once you take the photo. It's, it's you know, editing is, is part of the whole digital workflow. And I've got an image here that I took. Um, it was actually, I think you were with us, yeah, we, when we were trying to get the superb parrots in Deniliquin. Oh. I happened to photograph Why this uh, kookaburra. Why didn't I get this <laughs> <laughs> I think you were somewhere else. Oh, that's annoying. It just happened to yeah, it just happened to fly in front in front of me. But the obviously the raw file is so flat, it's almost devoid of colour, but in reality, in real life, it looked a lot more like the processed image. That obviously the raw files collected the information and then just with a little bit of processing, I've processed it to much more lifelike and to bring out the details. And I guess that's ultimately what it's about, going from that raw to the final product. And I think this would be the perfect example that I was just referring to as well, where the raw file delivers you a flat kind of gray, boring looking file that it requires yeah. you to bring back to life to it. But because it's so flat and neutral, it actually contains the most information possible. So we can get the absolute most out of it and actually transform it into the image that we saw in the field. Mm, yeah, for sure, definitely. You've shared with me a before and after of some bee eaters uh, that you took. I noticed that you took this way, way back in 2007. And so when did you start taking editing seriously and when did you learn about it to get images looking like this bee eater? Well, actually the first version of this picture looked nothing like the picture that I edit now. So I think I got a lot more into taking nice pictures, but it took me a lot longer to understand editing and to learn editing. When you start Photoshop, it's just this overwhelming program where you can do anything you wanna do, but you have absolutely no idea how to do any of it. <laughs> it has been a long process for me. And I think this is a good example where shooting in raw helps me so much as well mm -hmm. because I could go back and have this really stunning image from I don't know 15 years ago or something mm -hmm. open it again and re-edit it with my new knowledge and getting a fantastic final image whereas if I had shot this in a different file format I would have just been stuck with the old picture so I think that's yeah, no, that is. a big thing for me shooting in raw and having shot in raw early now allows me to recover or improve up on a lot of my old images simply by applying my new and better knowledge to it. No, for sure. Um, probably won't go into detail today between RAW and JPEG. Um, Jan did do a video recently about the difference between that you can check out um, and have a look, but we obviously shoot in RAW for all those reasons that he's mentioned. Is there any other software that you use to edit your photos? So once you get back from the field, what do you, what's your process? And, and I guess also, how do you store your photos? <laughs> Well, I use Fastone Image Viewer to look through my RAW files. It's a free program and you can just really quickly click through your RAW files and look at them really easily at 100%. And that's something that I'm very fond of because I like to make sure that my files have critical sharpness. So being able to just zoom in and then scroll through all the files at 100% at almost no delay is something that I really appreciate and that really speeds up my workflow. But other than that, I only use Photoshop. So I use Camera Raw to do all the adjustments to the raw file mm -hmm. and then open up the file and do all my adjustment layers in Photoshop and then save it as a PSD file. Mm -hmm. When it comes to storage, at the moment, I'm basically just saving my files in folders and then have multiple backups on external hard drives to be sure that I don't lose any of my files. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave links below in the description to this Fastone image viewer that Jan mentioned. Um, I guess the question is, do you enjoy the editing process and how long does it take on some images? I enjoy it to a degree <laughs> and usually it takes way too long, especially if I really like an image, I'll fiddle with it for way too long to make sure that it looks like absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. So anywhere from like five minutes to maybe up to an hour if it's like a very difficult image. Editing has become a little bit less of a priority for me, so I try to only edit the images that I really love, that are real standouts, mm -hmm. and then put a little bit more effort into them. So editing probably would take me on average maybe 
10 to 20 minutes for a nice bird photo, just making sure everything is perfect. Whilst we're talking about editing and, and the power of Photoshop and that, I guess it's also important that we cover how important it is to try and get it right in the field. You obviously know what you're doing in the field to make your editing process easier. So maybe if you could just talk us a little bit about what you're doing in the field to, to make your editing process easier. Well, I think the first thing is to get your exposure right. I made a whole video on mastering exposure, so I think I would recommend watching that because it's a bit too detailed mm -hmm. to just explain it. But the theory is that you want to expose your image as bright as possible, so exposed to the right of your histogram, to get a really nice, bright, flat file that has maximum detail, and that's what I try to achieve, basically. So the only thing that actually represents or shows you how your exposure is working is the histogram. So I think it's very important that you understand it and that you use it in the field to be able to expose as far to the right without clipping any of the highlights and getting the most perfect raw files. Because the better your raw files, the better will be your final images. There's no way around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you just touched on it there and it's something I get asked a fair bit as well. And that is how do you deal with noise Obviously with the older crop bodies and the older cameras, they didn't handle it as well, but some people were probably surprised to know that you don't really apply any noise reduction at all because you're obviously getting your exposure bang on in the field. And if you do that, there's a lot less need for noise reduction and post-processing. Well, I'm usually trying to get a somewhat light background. And if you have a light background, noise shows up a lot less than if you're shooting like on dark backgrounds or dark green background. Yeah. This is something, if you look at my images, I try to avoid having dark green backgrounds at them at all costs, basically. So if it's really bad, then I will apply it, but I think there's too much emphasis on it almost, and people spend so much time running noise reduction rather than making sure that the image is perfectly exposed and looking really nice. Yeah, no, good tips for sure. Uh, I guess the other thing I'll just quickly notice you mention is you just talked about the dark backgrounds, light backgrounds. This also leads into the light that you have in the field and the conditions that you're shooting in. I've got a couple of images here of uh, the first one is a spoonbill was taken before the sun was up. It's quite dark with a dark background. So it's a very flat bluish image, whereas contrast that to only half an hour later and I photographed this egret and that dark green becomes a light green because the sun's warmed it up. So obviously the color temperature of the sun and the scene can make a big impact on the final image as well, can't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, light with photography is probably the key. Like I personally just like to shoot in really flat light because then it gives me an even flatter file that I can then tweak in the direction that I want. But with sun, I think you get really nice colors, especially if it's kind of early in the morning or later in the day. But you also have to be aware with, especially shooting with like bright sun, like that egret you just showed mm -hmm. an hour later, would probably be very hard to expose because in this image the light is just perfect it hits the background and the bird with the kind of same intensity mm -hmm. but as the sun goes higher and the white becomes much brighter you will have to start under exposing because your camera sensor can't handle the dynamic range anymore mm -hmm. and then suddenly your background becomes really dark even though it's not that dark in real life well this is why i kind of like to have lighter backgrounds because then exposure is easier because the contrast between the bird and the background isn't so much and it's easier to expose and you can actually shoot longer because your background doesn't go so dark so quickly yeah no, a really good point i must admit i have struggled and cameras in general struggle to expose white birds uh, and dark backgrounds, for sure, it's, it can be a difficult thing to do. Um, so I asked Jan to uh, process one of my flame robin images that I took, so I sent him the raw file, and he was kind enough to process it for me. Uh, so Jan, in his masterclass video, he has a basic workflow and then some advanced workflows, so he's sort of done both. So I've sent you the raw image, what are you thinking when you immediately see it? You see that the color balance isn't quite right, are you thinking of the crop? What's sort of going through your head when you first see a raw image like that? Well, whenever I see a red or an orange bird, my alarm bells go <laughs> off. It's like, oh my God, this is going to be terrible to edit because Photoshop and the raw converter will really struggle to keep any detail in red or yellow or orange color. It's by far the worst color to process. Mm -hmm. What usually happens, it oversaturates it and you lose all the detail in it. So that's the first thing I noticed. I mean, this image is exposed pretty well. If you go 
Too much, I'd probably like to be a little bit brighter, okay. but then if you go much brighter, you start to lose detail on the side of the bird and on that white wing strip that's already kind of struggling. Mm -hmm. So it's a very tricky bird to expose because, yeah, exposed to bright, you lose detail, exposed to dark, you're pulling it up and it's kind of a struggle as well. So it's tricky, but that was the first thing I thought. And then the rest of the image I thought was very nice and it would just need a little bit of a crop mm -hmm. and yeah, personally, I like to probably lighten the background a little bit, but that's something I would only do in my advanced process. Yeah, no, that's good tips. And just, just quickly with the cropping, how, how do you decide the crop? Is it just, a, a, for me, it's something that's just through experience, you know what you like, and it's almost an instinctive thing um, as opposed to following any sort of defined rule. But how do you crop? It's all feel for me. People have always said I have nice compositions, but that usually just happened. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, I can't describe it. It's just something I crop and then I move it around and it just feels right at a certain point. Yeah. Like I don't follow any rules or swirls or <laughs> angles or I don't know. There's heaps of different advice on that. I find that it's way too technical for me. I'll just crop it to the point where it looks nice. And again, I think it comes down to you you can crop your image whatever way you it's want true. like there's no mm. real rules behind it yep so this uh the basic edit that you've done uh obviously makes the image look a lot better and it's actually a very quick process isn't it you're just doing a few adjustments to obviously the the white balance of the image the contrast and a few other little things which doesn't take that long and it's not that hard to do really is it well this was probably 30 seconds so i opened the raw file in camera raw mm -hmm. I chose a color profile and that's something that's very important and something that I think people underestimate as well. There's a lot of different color profiles and those are there no matter what pro what program you use, whether it's Lightroom, Capture One or Camera Raw, there's a lot of sort of predefined standard profiles that are applied to your raw file. So you never really get to see your true raw file. You get to see it through a filter pretty much that's applied by the raw converter mm -hmm. that you're using. and so. I always think it's important to pick the right profile, brighten it a little bit, pull the highlights down a bit, and I think made it a little bit warmer. Mm -hmm. And then I just applied levels, curves, saturation, and I'm done. Yep. And so this is basically something that I just have in my masterclass, the basic process. If you don't really want to do much to your images at all, it still lets you take them from a good level to a great level without really spending any time mm -hmm. on it. And then if you want to take it further to take them to that next level or fiddle around with them a bit more, I have my advanced process where I go a lot more into detail and apply changes to like certain areas of the bird. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the basic process, I basically just apply everything to the whole image of bits. Yeah, no, for sure. And obviously we move on to the advanced image and I can immediately see that you've lightened the background, mainly the dark greens, you've brought them up. It appears you've removed a slightly out of focus rock that was a little bit distracting in the bottom left. Mm. And the um, you've fixed the blow and highlight on the wing. And obviously the orange is a little bit on the chest is a little bit more sort of even over the bird. That's sort of what I'm instantly noticing just looking at it. Is that roughly what you've done? What always seems to happen, especially if you have like a bright bird with the limited dynamic range of the camera is that Usually the bird and your foreground is too bright mm -hmm. and your background is too dark. So I guess in my photos, I always try to kind of even that out or match that mm -hmm. up. I think in the second image, you can see nicely how the intensity of the light on the background and the bird seems to be kind of similar mm -hmm. now. Whereas before the bird and especially the rock as well, I darkened the rock a fair bit. You can see just all the light kind of reflecting catching on that rock in the other image yep. so i darkened that down in the first image kind of drawing more of the tension towards the bird mm -hmm. and then yeah i definitely worked on the orange i actually desaturated the orange and then used selective color to bring it back to the color that's a good trick to maintain detail so if i desaturate it i keep more detail in it but if i deset just desaturate it it kind of starts to look pale or loses the right color so i use selective color in this instance to bring it back to that sort of orange color. The other thing, as you said, I just lighten the background slightly and all I've done basically is try to make the bird the hero of the mm -hmm. shot by 
making the background slightly lighter so the top of the bird stands out a little bit more. Personally, I think I took it to another level, but like I said, whether you prefer the raw, the basic or the advanced version, that's really up to you. But I really like to know about all the things you can do to your images so you can decide what they look like. I really appreciate you going through that and I think you touch on good points. I think editing is a creative pursuit as well. I think photography in general is a creative thing. I don't like how people say this is right or this is wrong, you should do that, you shouldn't do that. Mm. Ultimately, it's up to the individual and what you like because you've got to get enjoyment out of it and you know editing is part of your creative process and I agree with you totally. So learning the editing process can also help your photography by working backwards, I think, because you see what the issues are when you're editing to try and fix that in the field so you don't have to deal with those issues later on. Oh, absolutely. I think that's a very good point. The more you understand editing or the more you edit your images, the more you see what you've done wrong in the field and the more you're aware of certain things. Like you're like, oh, I always blow out these highlights on the bird, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I have to be a little bit more aware. So maybe you could show us your edit now. Yeah, look, I processed this image probably last year, obviously before I'd watched your course and learned a few of the different things. And uh, this, you can have a look on the screen now. So it's similar, isn't it? But it, the background's slightly darker. As you mentioned, maybe not as much color in that rock but you've definitely dealt with the oranges and that's something that I'll need to learn to do and add to my toolkit when I process images in the future. What do you think of the difference? What I find amazing that we almost chose the identical crop, oh, like <laughs> almost 100% identical without any guidance, just by going by our feel. So I think that's a pretty cool. Yeah, true. I think both are really nice edits and I think mm -hmm. this is where the personal preference comes in. Yep. I like the background a little bit brighter, the rock a bit more colorful. Mm -hmm. You kept it a little bit different, but that's both are really nice images. One's my style, one's your style. Like this isn't really one style everyone should aspire to. It mm -hmm. should really be just your style and whatever you're happy with. I think this is a good example where you can get basically three really nice looking images with my basic to advanced process in your editing. Mm -hmm three similar looking images, mm -hmm. but both are a little bit different and you can probably find a nice thing in each three of them that you like. Um, so I th something that I get asked a bit and people will probably be surprised by this answer, but is how do you deal with sharpening and do you sharpen your images? Well, again, unless I make a really big print, I don't sharpen my images at all anymore. I apply just the standard sharpening in camera raw, but that's not very much. But I guess I'm using pretty good gear. So generally when I got a shot, it is pretty crisp. And if I apply more sharpness, I'm almost creating artifacts basically. Mm -hmm. So I never really felt the urge to add a lot more sharpness. You often get people who find Photoshop quite daunting. Uh, a lot of people just refuse to use it. Yeah, they just find it very difficult to use. What's your advice for someone just starting out with Photoshop or who hasn't really got a lot of experience with it? Get my masterclass <laughs> and you will probably <laughs> jump 10 years ahead in the queue. Yeah, fair point. Fair I know point. it sounds a bit cheesy, but it's really the truth. Like this is something that you said you would have liked when you started out, or mm -hmm. for me, that's something that I wish I've had because it is totally overwhelming. When I started out in Photoshop, I didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you can do anything in Photoshop, but unless you know how to do it, there's just no way to do it. So you can, you certainly don't have to spend money, but what you have to spend is time on watching a lot of videos, watching other people edit and just get an idea of what they do and then incorporate it into your own workflow. Yeah, no, some good advice. I, I'm much the same. I just, uh, you know, watched some YouTube videos and asked other photographers how they went about doing it and picked up little things and obviously your course has helped me. I did ask a few of my uh, subscribers if they had any questions and a couple of them popped up. Some of them we've already answered, uh, a lot of them about noise and sharpening. Um, one of the, a good one here is what are the signs that you're over editing? Is there such a thing as over editing? <laughs> if it's purely your choice, what you want your images to look like. Yeah. Some people might make the choice and say they want the bird to look 100% like they look in the field. And that's their choice. Some people say they don't want to edit. Mm -hmm. Some people like to do a lot of editing. Like I said before, I don't think there's any right or wrong and it comes down to personal choice. I would say if you're doing too much is when you're doing things that are not necessary. Like I brighten a background that's already nice. 
or yeah. I'm darkening down something that's already dark. When you're basically doing things you don't have to do, I think that would be the case. Yeah, and just one last question here, your guy Vickers says, how do I successfully remove unwanted objects like an unwanted branch near the bird? And you do actually go through this in your masterclass and there are some tools that are available. Uh, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. And like you just said, you have to make a decision whether you do go to that effort. I would usually use the clone tool and the patch tool to that. No, I think that covers pretty much everything. Um, I appreciate the time that you've taken today. Just for people that are sure. wanting to find out where this masterclass is, how do they find it? Um, where do they go to look for it? Well, hopefully you will put a link in your description. <laughs> that would be the easiest. Otherwise, you can just go to my website. You will find it there as well or go to my YouTube channel or my Instagram or yeah, send me a message or email and I will hook you up. All right. Thanks for that. Take care. Cool. See ya. Well,